our pleasure to welcome back again Paul Carden to continue our journey from Athens to Ephesus with an emphasis on missions. I got the order wrong in the first service. I got it right this time. We're moving chronologically through the book of Acts with Paul from Athens to Ephesus. Paul Carden, please. Good morning. Oh, uh, how many of you are taking the Acts challenge? Raise your hands. I'm going to embarrass some of you. Oh, one hound sneaking up. I'd say about 20 people talked to me after the two services last Sunday. What is the Acts challenge for those of you who were not here? I am you, encouraging you strongly to set apart time to read the entire book of Acts from chapter 1, verse 1, till the very end of chapter 28 at one go. This way you will get the sweep of the book, the, the narrative force of the book. You will understand how the, all the people involved relate to, to one another. Can you imagine deciding to just start watching Downton Abbey season three, episode two? You'd be cheating yourself. You'd probably be mystified. What's going on? These people are interesting. They have nice clothes. But what, how did all this happen? Well, you'd be kind of lost. You'd pick up something after a while, but this is how people read the Bible too often. And the book of Acts is such a rich narrative. Don't miss out. I encourage you strongly to do it. And if Portuguese is your first language, this is a great way to do it. This is the Nova Versão Transformadora. Just came out from Editora Mundo Cristão. And they have published the Bible in three volumes, uh, without chapter and verse divisions, so that you can read the Bible without those things distracting you, so that you can go through an entire letter, an entire gospel, for example. Reading it as the original readers did, at least much more closely. So I commend this to you. It's available at bookstores. But this is Mission Sunday, and I'm dropping things. Uh, the solution is to get a bigger platform, which seems not to be available, or to keep dropping things on chairs behind me. Uh, beloved, just consider for a moment uh, that the geographic center of Christianity is shifting. It's shifting southward. Maybe some of you already knew this. Maybe you've read Philip Jenkins' book, The Next Christendom. But uh, it's not so much in places like North America and Western Europe. It's in places like Africa. Now try to imagine for just a moment that in 1965, about a quarter of the population of Africa self-identified as Christian. Half a century later, that number had roughly doubled. Doubled. Consider that in a place like Uganda, in East Africa, a country the size of Oregon. By mid-century, there may be more people actively attending church than in the four or five largest countries in Europe combined. This has serious implications. And one of the questions we have to ask in light of this is, what kind of Christianity is it? Come with me to East Africa. Come with me to Uganda for just a moment. Imagine, if you can, you are a pastor. Though your childhood home was nominally Anglican, no one ever really discipled you. By the time you reached adulthood, you had no faith to speak of. I mean, if anyone asked you if you were a Christian, you'd say yes, but you couldn't explain what you believed. But one night, as you walk home from your job, you hear singing from a nearby street, and it's a Pentecostal prayer service. Amidst the clapping and shouting, the preacher invites people in the audience to come forward to receive Jesus. And so, despite some hesitation, you finally respond to the call. And you walk to the front of the church and you repeat a prayer. After this, you begin to attend regularly. You even become part of the choir and your musical gifts bring you to the attention of others. And very soon, people encourage you to take a step further in faith and become a pastor. 
So, armed with a New Testament in English that you barely understand, and with no theological training at all, you step out in faith and declare yourself a pastor, preaching first by the roadside and the markets and eventually renting a small hall where you give sermons based on various teachings that you hear from other pastors on radio and TV. For leading Sunday school, you use a colorful magazine called Awake. It's published in the local language by Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's the only spiritual literature that you see or really can afford. The multiple faith offerings you take in each church service are just enough to buy you nice clothes and feed your family, even though you promise miracles and riches to your congregation, just like those guys on TV. But as time goes by, you see that members of your flock, uh, even some of your helpers, are disappearing as local prophets and apostles advertise their services, which promise miracles and riches and are more exciting than yours. Not only that, but foreign cults with their fine buildings and friendly missionaries also lure some of your congregation away. And some of the families in your church are split in two by these groups. And the people in your church are asking questions for which you have no answers. So what do you do? Well, you do what anybody would do. You hop in your car, you drive to the nearest Christian bookstore, and you go through the shelves and you see if there are any good books on cults or apologetics, something that will help you to get a good grip on this situation. And, and if there's not one there, there's really no problem. You get back in your car, you go home, and you go on the internet, and you start looking for good articles by sound teachers that will tell you about uh, how to answer those cult missionaries and get those families back in your church, right? Well, except there's a problem. You don't have a computer. Uh, you have no access to the internet except for an email account you can hardly use. You don't have a library and you don't have any Christian bookshop in your town or in your entire district. And even if you did, the books would be costly beyond your means. And by the way, you don't have a car. So you're afraid and confused. You can't ignore these problems, but you have no solutions. Should you go with one of the foreign groups that invite you to join them? What will you do? Welcome to East Africa. Turn with me now to Acts chapter 18. Because we are picking up the story where we left off in our last episode, as we might say. Get rid of this too. As you turn to Acts chapter 18, I want to again explain that in this two-part series, we're looking at two dimensions of the missionary task, two apostolic imperatives in parallel, okay? In Acts 17 in Athens, Paul is all about preaching the gospel. In Acts 20 to the elders of Ephesus, his emphasis is protecting the gospel. In Acts 17, the emphasis is on growing the church. In Acts 20, the emphasis is on guarding the church. In Acts 17 at Athens, the, Paul is building bridges to non-believers. In Acts 20, Paul is building barriers to deceivers. In Acts 17, Paul is helping us to reach non-Christian religions and worldviews. And in Acts 20, he's helping us to resist counterfeit Christian movements. And this, by the way, in my opinion, after 34 years in this field, may be the single most serious and neglected threat that we face in Christian missions today. Which brings us to Acts chapter 18. And again, this is going to be a brisk ride if you were here last Sunday. So, as the chapter begins, Paul is at Corinth for a year and a half. He meets, uh, do you still have this expression, Casal Vinci, here? Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, what a pair. 
Paul joins up with them. He not only does ministry with them, he actually does business with them. They're making tents together because Paul is not above earning money with his own hands when the circumstances require. And uh, uh, they're in Ephesus. Uh, it's, it's a great thing because when they get tired of him at the synagogue, he says, fine, he leaves the synagogue, moves next door to the synagogue, and the synagogue leader and his family are all converted and join with him. Paul, who gets beaten up and, and escapes barely with his life again and again, has a vision from the Lord who says, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and don't be silent, for I'm with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. What a word of comfort that was. But the Jews are still trying to shut him down, so they drag him in front of the proconsul, a guy named Gallio. And they say, this guy's teaching contrary to the law. And Gallio says, big deal, paraphrase. Like, this is your problem, not mine. And the Jews are so frustrated with this outcome that they take the new synagogue leader and start beating him up in front of the consul, who just kind of shrugs it off. Paul gets away. Uh, uh, he and... Priscilla and Aquila go to uh, Ephesus and he reasons with the Jews and it's interesting. Usually at the synagogue, they chase him away. They say, please, can you stay longer? He says, no, but if the Lord wills, I'll be back. So stay tuned. So he leaves, goes to Caesarea, goes to Antioch and the third missionary journey begins and it begins with a bang because we're introduced to a guy named Apollos. Now, Apollos is a man mighty in the scriptures. He's an Alexandrian by birth. He's eloquent, and he's been instructed in the way of the Lord. He's speaking out boldly, but Priscilla and Aquila take him aside, and they explain the way of God to him more accurately. The guy's doing the best with what he's got, but they disciple him. They bring him up in the faith. They make him mightier still in the word of God. And so what happens next? The churches send him forth with their blessing. Verse 27, and he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. You see what he is doing. He's using apologetics. He's not only strengthening the church through his gifts, but verse 28, he is powerfully refuting the Jews in public. Uh, J.B. Phillips says he's reducing them to confusion. I wish I were there, uh, not because I don't like Jews, but when people are publicly opposing the gospel, there is a time and a place to publicly stand up and make things clear. And this is what he was doing. And it was a beautiful thing. So, chapter 19, Paul is at Ephesus. He meets some other people who don't have the whole message of the gospel. He clues them in. He lays hand on them. Uh, they, they're baptized. Things are going swimmingly, except, of course, in the synagogue. After three months, they tire of him. He moves to the school of Tyrannus, and he teaches there for two years. And in this way, the word of the Lord is heard all through Asia by both Jews and Greeks. So one door closes, another door opens, the gospel goes forth. God is performing extraordinary miracles through Paul, and even through his handkerchiefs. People are being healed. But people are also trying to imitate Paul in inappropriate ways. Maybe you'll remember the story of the seven sons of Sceva who are trying to use a formula to cast demons out of people saying things like, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. And they come to a demon-possessed man and they try to use this lingo on him. And he says, really? Really? I recognize Jesus, so I know about Paul, but who are you? And the demon-possessed man beats up all seven of them. They run from the place naked and bleeding. And everybody hears about this, of course. And their response is, is to be very afraid. But it's a holy fear because the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. And imagine... What's going on here in Ephesus? Fantastic things. People who are into macumbaria, uh, the sort of Jewish type, are taking all their magic objects, all of their books, which are fabulously valuable, 
and expensive. They're dragging them out and they are burning them publicly. Worth about 50,000 pieces of silver, a fortune. And they're saying, no more. The word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Paul says, okay. He's purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. He also wants to go to Rome. And that's what he begins to do. Although uh, some silversmiths get really mad because he's messing with their business. Do you remember this? A guy named Demetrius says, wait a minute. If, if, if this message of Paul keeps going forth and prospering as it is, we're, we're going to be out of a job. Nobody's going to buy our idols. And besides, people aren't going to think well of Artemis anymore. And so he riles people up. They wind up in the theater. There's a crowd for two hours basically screaming, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, over and over. Until the town clerk finally says, knock it off. Paul wants to go speak to this crowd, but his people say, no, don't do this. Probably a good idea not to speak to that crowd. But they were dispersed. Paul gets away again. And so we come to chapter 20. Paul is in Macedonia. He's in Greece. And eventually he winds up in Troas, where he's speaking to the disciples and he is talking and talking and talking. He's talking till midnight. And even though Paul is a really good speaker, at least one person falls asleep. His name is Eutychus and he falls out the window and dies. And so Paul, quick on his feet, goes down and revives him by the grace of God, makes him alive again. And then he goes back to talking until dawn. And then uh, after that, he makes a series of stops by ship from Assos to Mytilene to Chios to Samos to Miletus. Verse 16 of chapter 20, Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And what an exciting time that was. You'll have to read ahead. So here in chapter 20, starting in verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And here is the overview of what he says. Okay? And remember, please, I'm going to overview this, we're going to read it verse by verse, and then we're going to have insights and applications. But this is a missionary message. Keep this in mind as we go through this. This is a missionary message that I'm reading here in Acts, not that I'm making up out of the thin gruel of my mind, but this is something that has application to how you do mission, and this church does mission, and all Christians do mission. Paul is our model in all of these things. He gathers them together, verses 17 and 18. He recalls his life among them, verses 18 to 21. He tells them that he's bound for Jerusalem and grim things await him en route, verses 22 to 24. He gives them a last goodbye. He appeals to his legacy and his integrity. Very important. Again, Paul is a model. He's not just boasting. He's not saying, see how great I am. This is the Paul who said, follow me as I follow Christ. Verse 28, he calls them to vigilance, these elders of Ephesus, for themselves and for all the flock. Verses 29 and 30, he gives them a prophecy. Verse 31, he calls them to vigilance again. And in verse 32, he gives them a benediction before he closes with another appeal to his legacy and his integrity. Because his example is something that must be followed, that they must not only observe and apply, and uses criteria for anyone who would come after him claiming to be a true servant of God. Are you with me? I hope so. Or have I bludgeoned you into some kind of sedated condition? We'll see. All right, Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17, reading to you from the New American Standard. Unless somebody wants to lend me their uh, New International Version. Somebody got one? Okay, here it comes. Pastor Nathaniel to the rescue. Just figured we'd be following more closely to... Oh, the microtype edition. Thank you. Okay. 
We'll do our best. Oh. Oh, the version for the blind. Thank you. <laughs> the blind leading the blind. Let's not go there. Okay. So beginning in verse 17. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. And when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day, my, day, day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me the prison and hardships are awaiting me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Even from your own number, Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away the disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning you, day and night, with tears. So now I commit you to God and the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. But I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and he prayed and they all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. All right. So how do we unpack this? Paul is serving the Lord with humility and with tears. He's suffering through the plots of the Jews. And what he's not doing is holding back on the gospel. He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. Not only was he teaching them the whole gospel, he was teaching the whole gospel everywhere. He was teaching it in the streets, from the pulpit, and in homes. Beware of anyone who has kind of an outside message and an inner message for initiates, for people who are sort of the in crowd, right? The, the, the people who are closer to the leadership or the people who have been deemed worthy of receiving the, the secret word from God. This is wrong. And Paul is making it quite clear that everybody heard the same message everywhere all the time. It's important to appreciate the importance of that. And what was his message? Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't preaching prosperity, miracles. He wasn't preaching himself. It was all about Jesus. He says he's going to Jerusalem. He's not coming back. But he says his life is not dear to himself. So in verse 25, again, he says, you won't see me anymore. But he's innocent. He says, he is guiltless 
of the blood of all men. And why is that? Again, because he has given them what he calls, in other versions, the whole counsel of God. Very important. Do you know any preachers, authors of books and Christian stores that are holding back on the gospel? Like, they just give you a happy, happy message. They don't talk about sin, judgment, our responsibility as believers. Those people are dangerous. They are. They're very dangerous, and Paul was not one of them, and we're not to be like them. And so he tells these elders of Ephesus, verse 28, be on guard, New American Standard. We have uh, in our ministry, the Centers for Apologetics Research in Kampala, Uganda, we have a ministry called Pastors on Guard, which is named for this verse. Be on guard for yourself and for all the flock. Well, that's interesting. You know that shepherds protect the flock, but he's telling the shepherds that they themselves are under an active threat. They're to be alert because there is real and present danger facing them. What could it be? What could it be? Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Wonderful verse affirming the deity of Christ, by the way. And he gives them a two-part prophecy. Verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. It's kind of an echo of Matthew 7, isn't it? Where Jesus warns us about wolves who are dressed like sheep. They're pretending to be harmless, but they are hungry. And these ravenous wolves, these savage wolves, are merciless. Paul is telling the elders, there is a threat from people on the outside who want to come into the church and basically devour the flock. How do they do that? Well, they don't, you know, do a shuhasku with them. They, uh, they consume their time. They consume them financially. They consume them sexually and exploit them. Elsewhere, Paul writes about those who would make merchandise out of you. This is the kind of thing that the savage wolves will do. And the elders of Ephesus must shepherd the flock to keep those people away. But then in verse 30, Paul really drops the bomb. And it must have made their blood run cold. He says, and from among your own selves, who's he talking to? The elders. From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things in order to draw away the disciples after them. Can you imagine how shocking that must have been? Was Paul just trying to impress them? Was, would he have said that unless it were really necessary? I think not. I think not. They needed to hear this. He was bound by obligation and moved by the Spirit to tell them that even some of them would become such men. Speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, verse 31, be on the alert. Now, did this thought just strike him in the middle of the night, knowing that he wasn't going to have any more opportunities to spend time with these elders? I think not, because he says, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. It was his custom to warn them. It was part of his proclamation, part of the discipleship process to hold their attention on these matters because the threat was real and constant. As a matter of fact, as you read the New Testament, notice please, from Matthew to Revelation, there are warnings about false teachers and false teachings in every single book except Philemon. Did you realize that? It's not because it's the only thing there is to think about or the most important thing, but the pattern is pretty profound and pronounced. And we would do well to take heed. 
Verse 32, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give the inheritance among all who are sanctified. And he says, verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or clothing. Again, keep your eyes open for those who do. Have you heard about such people in the news? People who claim to be Christian? People who have big TV shows? They're out there. Paul is giving us the kind of warning that will help us to know the criteria by which we identify dangers from without. And we'll talk about those in just a second. And dangers from within. And he talks about how he met his own needs, helping the weak, and indeed confirming what Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to, than to receive. So, Again, Paul is our model for mission and ministry. I have to check the time. Oh good, there's 10 minutes before Pastor Nathaniel drags me from from the platform. Um, What do we do with this? Well, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. At the end of First Thessalonians, which is a wonderful letter, very affectionate letter, uh, it's, it's, it's another wonderful thing to read straight through, Paul gives a series of instructions, very brief instructions, you know, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. But in verses 19 to 22, he says something that is of particular interest in light of what we've been talking about. And in fact, this emphasis I mentioned in the rest of scripture uh, doesn't really matter in terms of interpreting the verse where you stand on the perpetuity of spiritual gifts. If you believe in in, in, in them uh, for today, it applies. If you don't, it applies. He says, don't quench the spirit, verse 19. Don't despise prophetic utterances. Somebody comes to you saying they have a message from God, don't just shut them down. But does that mean you just gobble it up? Nope. Verse 21. He says, examine everything carefully. How does it read in the NIV? Hmm? Test all things. How do you test all things? And what things are they? Messages supposedly coming from God. Brothers and sisters, are there a lot of self-appointed apostles and prophets running around Brazil... Oh, yes, there are. Does a false prophet or or apostle kind of cheapen the title of apostle or prophet? Yes, it does. Somebody comes to you saying that they're speaking for God. You are to test what they say because the message of a prophet, the job of a prophet is to speak for God. You're not to test him based on how nicely he dresses or how big a car he drives or how many people show up at his church. You test his words and you test them by the written word of God. You do it consistently. You do it faithfully. You neglect it at your peril. And if somebody else comes to you and they need help, you need to be able to open the scriptures with them and test that so-called prophet. You examine everything carefully. And if what they say is good, you hold fast. It says here in the NAS. Hold fast to what is good. But verse 22, you abstain. You hold yourself away from, you avoid every appearance of evil. Now, can you imagine these guys on TV uh, getting as far as they have, stealing as much money as they have, if people had simply applied these verses? Not so many people would be crying now. Uh, Not so many lives would be ruined Not so many people on the outside would be saying, is that Christianity? I don't want it. Which is pretty serious business. So Paul gives us two don'ts and three do's. Because the gospel is precious. The church is precious. The gospel must be guarded. The church must be guarded. We have these savage wolves and their servants on the outside. And I want to make the distinction very carefully because this is an application point. The wolves are very often people like Joseph Smith, who started the the Mormon church, 
and the apostles and so-called prophets who followed him. But they also have their servants. I'm not saying that you're to counterpunch the poor young men and women who show up at your door or in the praza, uh, Mormon missionaries, and treat them like they were Joseph Smith himself or the very incarnation of Satan. That would be wrong, wrong, wrong. That's not what we're doing. That's not what I'm encouraging you to do. In fact, what Paul tells Timothy in his second letter in chapter 2 is that the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him, to do their will, to do his will. That's the attitude we're to have. But we are to reject, forcefully reject, the counterfeit gospel that these people bring. And the men speaking perverse things, well, uh, but I should say one more thing about the threat from without. We would classify, for example, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, at least I would, as the class, as the threat from without, because they reject all other churches. They say they are the only true Christians. They have denied the essentials of the historic Christian faith. I mean, the Mormon church says there are many, many gods. You can be one of them. That God, our Heavenly Father, is a human being who progressed to the state of godhood. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny the Trinity, saying the Son is not God, the Spirit is not God, only the Father is God, and we are the only church, they don't even say church, the only group on the planet that follows his will and tells you how to interpret the Bible. Nobody else knows, except a handful of our guys in Brooklyn, right? They are outside, even though they carry Bibles. But there and then there are the people from within, as it were. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, an Igreja Universal, Internacional, Mundial, Global? There's a lot of them, uh, and they are not preaching the gospel. They're not even Protestant. They're not even Protestant because they're not talking about any real salvation message. It's about giving to get. It's about enriching the leaders. It's, it's more of a, an emprendimento. It's more of a, a business, really. Uh, my colleague, Paulo Romero, maybe you've seen his book, Super Crenches or uh, Decepcionados com a Graça, very important books. He won't even call them churches anymore. He says they're, uh, they're it's, it's like a grupo empresarial. And it's quite true. Uh, you have other false apostles and prophets. People like Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Andrew Womack. Why am I naming their names? Is it just, just to give me a thrill here, just to ruin your day? It's not. If you test their doctrine, it's poison. And I also have precedent. If you've read in the word from Paul and John, for example, about Hymenaeus and Philetus and Alexander and Diotrephes, people who were dividing the body of Christ, people who needed to be named so that other believers could be warned. You don't do this indiscriminately. You don't do it rashly. But it needs to be done. It needs to be done. So coming to a close here, I encourage you with a five-fold response. That's ten, this is five. A five-fold response in light of the foregoing. And by the way, well, I have brought resources to the community groups to help equip those folks in those five groups I met with to identify, understand, answer, and evangelize groups like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm also going to leave a very small supply of the remaining copies with Pastor Nathaniel that you can borrow. Yes, here I am presuming to uh, decide how these will circulate, but they were almost fighting over in them in some of the community groups, so be warned. All right, what is the five-fold response in light of this? First of all, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, Seek to know 
the whole Word of God in context. One of the most lovely thing you, things you can do with a Mormon or someone who comes to your door or who challenges you from the Bible is to open the Bible and say, let's read this passage together and start from the beginning of the chapter and work up to the section that they're quoting. Because very often the answer is right there. They've pulled it out of its context. And a text out of context becomes a pretext for error. So, and you can solve that often very quickly. Number two, preach the whole counsel of God. Be careful you're not just giving somebody a safe, watered-down message about asking Jesus into your heart. That's not the worst thing in the world to say, but what is the gospel? It's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5 in its essence. It's that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that was seen by many witnesses. This is an objective fact that we respond to by faith, by believing, being baptized, and confessing that we believe. Third, we disciple for discernment. Okay, I'm going to do it. Sorry, Pastor Nathaniel. Turn with me quickly to Hebrews 5. This is so important. I believe it's basic to the life of any church. Talk to me in the lobby. Drag me out to the street if you disagree. But what do we have here in Hebrews 5? The author is talking about the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. It's heavy stuff. It's very important. Very, very important. Verse 11, chapter 5, he says, Concerning him, Jesus, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, instead you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. Pay close attention. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, spiritually speaking. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern between good and evil. Do you understand that the goal of discipleship, one of the main goals of discipleship is discernment. People are growing in faith that they can discern with the word of God, biblical discernment. It's so important to be able to tell good from evil, light from dark. Isn't this what you try to do in the natural with your own physical children? It's a survival skill. Turn with me to Ephesians 4 as I close. Ephesians 4 is making the same point but in a very colorful way. Paul is talking about the unity of the church. He's talking about the roles that God has given to various people in the body as apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints, verse 12, for works of service, the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and maturity, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What happens? What do we gain if we do this? Verse 14, as a result, we will no longer be children. The picture he paints is of babies tossed here and there by waves. The, the picture in the Greek is kind of like an infant bobbing about on the water and spinning rapidly. It's a very interesting image. And it's as entertaining as it might be for a moment in your mind, it's not something you want to be as a Christian. We will no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, and by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. But instead, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Do you understand the contrast he, he draws between these people who are tricking you this is the absence of love. Instead, we have speaking the truth in love to grow up in all respects into him who is the head, even Christ, that the whole body being fitted and held together 
by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Be on the alert. Nowhere to get answers. Speak the truth in love. Be critical thinkers in the healthiest sense. You can be prepared, brothers and sisters, and you can make a difference. Please pray with me. Holy God, thank you for making us aware of what dangers surround us spiritually and what measures we can take, not just alone, but as the body of Christ, as elders and deacons, as leaders and followers, people bought by Jesus' blood and committed to the growth of his kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for making it clear what we need to watch for so that we can take action so that we can act with compassion toward those who have been taken captive, like the people who are being robbed by the TV preachers, like the people who have been deceived by the Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups who would like to know you. Make us, Lord, your ambassadors to these people. Make us your watchmen on the wall. And be glorified in this church, we pray. We know the hour is coming. We know the time is short, and you are a great God who deserves everything from us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.